Yeah. Can you maybe turn me down a wee bit, Andrew, please? I don't want to deafen you. Yeah. Okay. We're nearly there, folks. Please be patient with me. Well, uh, this evening feels like a, a fresh start. <laughs> and uh, there's been a few things that have been going over my mind over the past few months about what I would preach on, what the Lord is really saying. And this came to me quite late in the day that we, we should do a series on uh, memorable 316s. <laughs> I hope you know what a memorable 316 would be. Who could give me a memorable 316? John chapter 3, verse 16. Well, uh, I'm not going to speak to you from John chapter 3, verse 16 uh, tonight. Um, it's going to be a different 316. It's actually going to be Matthew 316. And also, uh, quite a few months back now at one of our leaders' meetings, uh, it was suggested, uh, perhaps maybe a bit stronger than suggested, that there might be the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the sermon. And uh, it's something that I have never done, I don't think, ever before. But uh, the Lord's just put it in my heart that you should have the opportunity uh, to ask questions if there's anything that you're not sure about, about what I'm saying, or you don't agree with, or something needs clarification, then uh, there is that opportunity. So I'm going to give you that opportunity tonight, and we'll see how it goes, yeah? But let's uh, begin with our Bible readings, and there are actually quite a lot of them. So I'm going to ask Mike to come forward and read the first reading for us, please. This is uh, Matthew 3 um, from the NIV, if you want to follow. Um, John the Baptist prepares the way. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt round his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem, and all Judea, and the whole region of Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe has been laid to the foot of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Baptism of Jesus. 
Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And John sent him. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up <laughs> out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. Him I am well pleased. Thank you very much, Mike. Now, our second reading Anne is going to give to us, and it's from John's Gospel, the same event. John chapter 1, verse 29 to 34. John testifies about Jesus. The next day, John was, saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water and with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Thank you. Now, there's going to be a final reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, please. It's a lot of reading tonight, but it's important that I think that we do read uh, these records of uh, uh, Jesus' baptism. Now, I've selected to read this one myself because it's got all the hard words in it, <laughs> as you will see in a moment. So, John's, uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Ituria and Traconitus, and Lysanias Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country round the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax has been laid to the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd answered. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money. And don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. 
The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his thrashing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. So Lord, we just simply ask that uh, you would speak into our hearts from your word tonight. We pray that we would come with uh, expectancy, that we would just be desperate to hear what uh, the living God would say to, to ordinary people like us who are living in this remote part of the world. Lord, bless us uh, with a message from your heart and your throne room tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, memorable 316s. These are all verses that we're going to be looking at that have a chapter 3 and have a verse 16. Uh, I've chosen ones that are really important, I think are important, that have something to say to us. And there are, they are memorable because I would like to think you might commit them to memory. It's so important that we actually memorize Scripture. And I'll put my hand up here. I'm, I'm one of the world's worst at memorizing things. When I was at school, I really struggled to memorize anything. And when I did memorize it, you could be sure it was gone within two or three days. Uh, and, and I've always been rather envious of people who seem to have great memories, you know, who memorize chunks and chunks off by heart. But I do think it is important, actually, that we memorize Scripture. And there have been many Christians over the years uh, who have been in positions where they haven't had Bibles. And they've maybe been persecuted, imprisoned. And, and what has been really precious and important to them is the Scripture that is lodged in their memories. Yeah. And in fact, when we used to run a children's club here called Happy Hour, we always had a spot, didn't we, for the memory verse. And there was always a prize the next week for those that could come forward and say the memory verse. I think we should reintroduce that. We'll probably have nobody here next Sunday night. <laughs> but we had lots of kids used to come forward and and. They were desperate to come forward and they would tell us the memory verse. And these are kids who are coming from non-Christian homes. Do you know what my prayer today is? That God by His Spirit would bring these verses back into their minds and remind them of who He is and how they could come to know Him. So memorizing Scripture is really important. And the verse tonight is actually, I'm actually bending it a little bit. I've made it two verses. It's Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And it's talking about the, the baptism of Jesus. As soon as he was baptized, he went up out of the water and heaven was opened. Yeah, at that very moment. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. That means coming down and remaining on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. It's great to hear something like that being said to you, isn't it? Yeah, I love you. I'm really, really pleased with you. And that's the words that Jesus heard that day. There are three things that are really in my heart from these verses. Um, one is a defining moment, a defining moment in history. The second one is this, Emmanuel revealed. 
And the third one is this, an open heaven. An open heaven. So let's think, first of all, about how this was a defining moment. And I want to try and set the scene for you. Uh, one of the, the, the key people that we hear about, apart from Jesus, is a man called John. He's called John the Baptist. And he was actually um, the cousin of the Lord Jesus, if you remember, for going way back to the birth of Jesus, um, that uh, uh, John was already on the way. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, he was the son of a priest, so that would make him of the priestly line. He was a prophet, a priest, and most of all, he was a preacher, a preacher of the Word of God. Huge crowds used to come to listen to him. I, I don't know if you've ever been in a big crowd listening to a preacher. How many of you have heard of Billy Graham? Yeah? What about Louis Palau? Yeah. Reinhard Bonnke? Yeah. You know, it's it said that for, for these preachers of the Word of God, that, um, you know, that it wouldn't be unusual for tens of thousands of people to turn up to their meetings. I've even heard it said that at one of Reinhard Bonnke's meetings, there was a million people were around to listen to him. When John Wesley was preaching, that, that old preacher, um, going back a few hundred years, people used to come out of the towns and villages and fill the fields. And he would stand in a high place in a hill and he would shout out the word of God to them. He, he, he didn't have amplifiers and loudspeakers. You know, he just shouted. What a voice he must have had. But he preached the word of God with passion and and some of these people that I've been thinking about here, evangelists of the 20th century, they really had a passion for Jesus and to make Jesus known. Well, John the Baptist was a preacher in that kind of mold. And Luke, Dr. Luke of Luke's gospel really fixes this moment in history for us in Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, when I was, I was reading about it being the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor, and he speaks about Herod, Herod and Philip, Lysanias and Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas. It helps us to actually make this a moment of history. This is not a story that's fictional. This is a moment of history that's recorded in the Bible. And uh, it was A.D. 30. When you actually work it out, it was A.D. 30 when John was proclaiming his message. Now, John was a powerful preacher. And people used to come from Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, from all the towns of Judea, that's that area surrounding Jerusalem, from the Jordan, and he was in the Jordan Valley, that's where he did his baptizing. And so people used to come from the Jordan Valley. There were crowds and crowds of people, I think there probably was thousands of people, came to listen to John's message. And uh, what a powerful guy. He was also a scary guy, right? Now, he wore a coat of camel's hair. Now, I don't know about you, but I really don't fancy wearing a coat of camel's hair. I, I think it would be very itchy for a start, yeah? I, I don't think it would have been the height of fashion, right? And, and uh, so he, he wore a coat of, uh, of, of, of uh, camel's hair and, and he had a leather belt around his waist holding it all together. And for his food, now get this, did you pick it up? He ate locusts and wild honey. That was his fare. He was a man that seemed to live in the wilderness places. And that was the kind of food that was available. It, it, it wasn't, he didn't visit the best restaurants that were around. You know, he, he made do with, with what he could get to live on. It didn't seem to be important to him to wear the best of clothes. 
and to eat the best of food. That wasn't high in his priority list. What was high in his priority list was God and making his God known to the people that they might have a relationship with God that he had for himself. That was the passion of his heart. Uh, and he wore a coat of, of camel's hair to keep him decent and modest. Uh, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Uh, I quite like the idea of the wild honey, but I don't fancy the locusts very much. But that was to keep body and soul together. That was the kind of guy that he was. He's, he's linked a lot to the prophet Elijah of the Old Testament, who was that kind of character. They would have had a lot in common. And here is John, the prophet, the preacher, and he sounded different. His message was different. It was real. It was passionate. And he drew people to himself like a magnet. People around recognized that he was different from the religious leaders. There was something that, that, that struck them as being genuine about John. And they wanted to find out more from him. Well, John's message, <laughs> uh, it was for everyone. It wasn't for the religious leaders. They probably didn't need or thought they didn't need to hear the message that John spoke. But they came. You know, they, they were probably examining their scrolls to, to see if what he said was accurate. You know, do you get people like that? That, 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 that test every word that the preacher has to say. And, and they might have been like that. We'll, we'll watch him and see if we can catch him out and ruin his reputation. Uh, but he also had ordinary people that came to him and they hung in his words. Tax collectors, the hated tax collectors, came to listen to John and they hung in his words. Roman soldiers came to listen to John and they hung in his words. What do we do? they said, as he roared out his message. And he was saying to them, you know, if you're going to be a follower of God, it, it has to be demonstrated in your life. So if you've got more clothes than you need and more food than you need, give them to the poor. Tax collectors only take the amount of tax that you should collect. Don't steal from people. And here's one for the Roman soldiers. <laughs> this is one for today as I think about all the strikes that are taking place. Be content with the money that you earn. Be content. He was just sold out for God. And his message was so powerful. And it was uncomfortable. Because he was saying God's judgment is coming. And he talked about the axe being laid to the root of the trees. And he was thinking of people, particularly I think the religious people, who, who, who spoke so much and, 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 and talked so much about keeping the commandments and were quick to point the finger at people who didn't keep the commandments and yet they did not keep them themselves. They didn't have love in their heart for people round about them. And he says, you know, the axe is going to come to the tree. And he talked about God's winnowing. Uh, and that links to this harvest time. You know, we've got combine harvesters that do all of that nowadays. But in these days, they used to cut, cut the harvest and it would be laid out in the ground and uh, they would get animals to tramp on it or they would beat it with canes, you know, the, the stalks, until the grain fell off, the stalks. Uh, and, and then they would, they would winnow it, they would have fans that they would blow over the grain so that the, the chaff would all be driven away. And only the wheat, the seed, would be left and collected. 
And John is saying, you know, it's only the seed that really counts. The chaff is going to be blown away. And God knows whether we're seed or whether we're chaff. And he talks about the unquenchable fire of God. In the fire of his judgment. That was the character of the message that he brought, this fiery preacher. And he called out on his audience to, to do several things. He said, I want you to confess your sin. I want you to repent of your sin. Now, repent is this Bible word that we don't often hear nowadays, but it's really important if we're going to know God and follow God. It's it's first of all knowing that we are sinners, that we have broken God's laws. Um, and we need to, con to, to, to confess our sin to God. That's the starting point of knowing God, is being honest with God and confessing our sinfulness and then repenting of it. That means saying to God, God, really, I'm really sorry for the sin in my life. Uh, and, and I'm turning away from the sin in my life, and, and I want to follow you and, and to do it well. It's like having a U-turn in your life away from sin to following God. And so John called them to confess their sin, to, to repent, to believe in God and His Word, and to be baptized. And that His baptism was one of repentance. In other words, it was a baptism that was was like being washed, right? It, it signified that their sins be falling away from them, they're being washed from their sin, yeah? And, and, and they would begin to follow God, and, and the way that they showed that they followed God was by the kind of lives that they lived. John says, bear fruit in your lives. Let me see that you really are going to follow God by the things that you do by the way that you love your family, by the way that you love people who are poor, by the fact that you don't steal anymore, by the, by the fact that you become content with what you have, what God has given to you. And, and we could go on and on and on. But that was a message that, that John proclaimed. But most of all, what he did that day was that he pointed to Jesus. And he saw Jesus coming in the crowd. And he turned around and he pointed to Jesus and he said, look at him. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John knew that this day was a defining day. A day when everything changes. Have you ever had any defining days in your life? I hope you have. If you're a Christian, you for sure have had a defining day in your life. The day when you met Jesus and you gave your heart and your life to Jesus. It's an unforgettable day, I hope. I really hope so. It certainly has been for me. And this was a defining day because Emmanuel is being revealed. That's the second thing. Emmanuel means God with us. Yeah, God with us. And Jesus appears and he's Emmanuel and he's a man but he's also God. Yeah. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right there at the beginning, John knew exactly who Jesus was, that he was going to come to bear our sins. He was the Lamb of God. He was the sacrifice that was going to be offered for the sins of the world. He knew it there right from the beginning, because God had planted it into his heart. Yeah. And here is, is Jesus, and Jesus comes to John and says, I want to be baptized. 
And John says, well, you know, I, it should be me that's baptized by you. Not you that's baptized by me. Jesus says to him, no, John. Fulfillment of righteousness means that you're going to baptize me. This is a very important moment. And by his baptism, everything changed, and Jesus steps out in three absolutely remarkable years of ministry in this world. Three remarkable, astounding years. Now, the, the religious people that were there, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, the really important people in the land, they, they were looking at, at Jesus coming forward and they were saying, who is this guy? You know, he's a carpenter's son and wearing carpenter's clothing. <laughs> he hasn't been to our university. But they didn't see and understand who he really was. Yeah. So what do we learn from Jesus' baptism? Well, the first thing I thought of this that is this. That true leaders in God's kingdom are humble people. They're really servant-hearted people. I was thinking about a verse in, in uh, Second Chronicles. I've marked it here so I could find it easily. Second Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 6, verses 5 and 6. These are words that were spoken by Solomon as he's thinking about the building of the, the great temple of God in Jerusalem. And he's, here's what he says, the temple I am going to build will be great because our God is greater than all other gods. But who is able to build a temple for him since the heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain him? <laughs> That's who Jesus was. The heavens cannot contain God. And yet here was God standing before them, bursting onto the scene publicly for the first time, and all of God was in Jesus. He's really God, and he's truly man. You know, you think about, we're well, thinking this morning, I think in our group, about you know, what Jesus was like as a man and, and the feelings that he had are feelings that, that we have in our lives. He was truly human. I'm sure he, he felt it hard when, when people spoke to him harshly, criticized him, mocked him. It would be hard to believe that he never felt any offense at that. You know, he could feel grief. He could feel sadness. All of these things that we feel, we, we don't read actually very much. You can correct me here, but we don't really hear very much in the Scriptures about Jesus laughing and being filled with joy. But I actually think he laughed a lot and he rejoiced a lot. And the scriptures record that, that it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and he despised the shame. Yeah. But he went through every kind of circumstance in life that we go through. And that's why he, today, as the risen Lord Jesus in heaven, can sympathize with us as our great high priest. You know, he's in heaven, but it doesn't mean to say he's far away. And as we're going through the toughest experiences of our lives, and some of you are going through tough ones, Jesus is right there. Just as near to you as he was to the woman at the well who felt ostracized, to Mary and Martha who'd lost their brother. Just as he was with the, the blind beggar who felt he was just worthless and was told he was worthless. 
And Jesus is just as close to us today as he was in these circumstances. He was the humble son of God. And I just love that. He didn't have a big head. He didn't come born into a castle, breaking and bursting into the scene on, on a white horse, but he came humbly. Yeah, Paul kind of records it for us in the book of Philippians chapter 2. These are words that you know well. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus Christ. What was Jesus' mindset? And is it mine? Is it yours? Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death of a cross. Our humble Savior and the character of his ministry was service, humble service. And I think it actually, despite the fact that, that uh, John was this robust, strong, kind of wild man who I imagine shouted and roared out his message, there was a humility about him too, wasn't there? As Jesus came to him to be baptized. And John said, but I'm not worthy to baptize you. I'm not even worthy to carry your sandals. More than, more than that, I'm not even worthy to take the place of a lowest servant and, and untie the laces on your sandals. That's how he felt in the presence of Jesus. How do we feel when we come into the presence of Jesus? How do we feel? Are we in awe of him? Do we perhaps even consider ourselves as equals with him? How do we feel? Does he capture our attention? Does he captivate us in the way that people were captivated in the land of Israel? Do we get captivated with Jesus today? Because I think we should be. I think we ought to be. Because he is our friend. Sometimes we sing a song, he's our brother. <laughs> he's God. And we must never forget that he is God. Yeah. One who loves us so very, very much. The question is, and maybe it's a question that's been in your mind, why did Jesus insist on being baptized by John? After all, he, he was the perfect man. He never did anything wrong. Why did he need to be baptized by John? And, and as we've read tonight, John couldn't figure it out either. Why did Jesus need to be baptized? And Jesus said to him, it was to fulfill all righteousness. Yeah. And I think that in Jesus' baptism, right there at the very start, he was in identifying himself with sinners. All the way through the journey in the next three years, 
He's identifying himself with sinners, although he never sinned himself. And three years later, they're going to take him. They're going to brutalize him. They're going to take him and nail him to a cross where he suffers and dies that awful death to fulfill all righteousness. He became sin who knew no sin. Why? That we, you, me, might become the righteousness of God in him. And so it was God's righteous plan that his son would be baptized by John. God had even whispered it into John's ear. You know, one of these days, keep your eyes open, John. One of these days, my son is going to come along and I want you to baptize him. It was a sign given to John from God to reveal Jesus to the people of Israel. And so John was baptized. Jesus was baptized by the apostle John. Yeah. No ordinary baptismal service, was it? <laughs> it really was no ordinary baptismal service. Because John took Jesus... And he took him and he put him down under the water, right? And then he came up out of the water, right? And what, what do we read? The memorable verse. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water and at that very moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting. That means coming on Jesus, remaining on Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, my only son, the son that I love. With him I am well pleased. And in that moment, I think God was saying, you know, he's been around for 30 years. And I'm really chuffed with him. I'm really pleased with my son. Yeah. He's lived up to all expectations. He's been a good boy, right? <laughs> well, I wonder how many of us when we were children, it could be said that we were good boys and good girls all of the time. Yeah. <laughs> if we're honest, we couldn't say that. Actually, in today's generation, the fact that we're saying sin doesn't matter anymore, all our children would be said that they were good children, wouldn't they? But not when it comes to, to God's assessment. <laughs> yeah. And Jesus was the son that he loved and delighted him. God's smile was on his son. I often wonder what it was like in in the home in Nazareth. You know, Jesus was the oldest of the family. From what we've read tonight, there was at least six other brothers and sisters in the family. What was it like in that family when you had Jesus as your big brother? The goody two-shoes that never did anything wrong, right? And you know what the younger children do when the older one is a goody two-shoes? They try and organize it so that he makes a mistake, uh, you know, and, and, and so that he loses his temper, yeah? <laughs> loses the heat, as we would say, and, and it'll, it'll maybe end up in a punch-up, right? Who, who here's got children and you've never had a punch-up in the family? Never. Never had a punch-up. You've never had a punch-up? They have had a punch up. <laughs> I, I was going to, I was going to think it, thinking that these are some special kids. <laughs> but it wasn't like that in the home of Joseph and Mary in Nazareth. <laughs> Jesus was the perfect son, and here's God the Father acknowledging that when Jesus is baptized. 
this is my boy that I'm really pleased with. I really love him. Yeah. And uh, this was the announcement at that very day on the 30th year Anno Domini as Jesus bursts out in the scene when everything is going to change. Yeah. Because the age of God's grace is being announced to the world. The age of God's grace. The Bible sometimes calls it the last days. Did you know that you're living in the last days in, the, in God's calendar? But it's also the age of God's grace. And God is something, has done something that's almost unbelievable if he had not revealed the mystery of the gospel of his grace. And that was that his son was going to come and be reviled and rejected and crucified. Isn't that amazing? That he would give his son to be treated that way, knowingly? He knew it was going to happen. It's all there in the Old Testament. He knew it was going to happen. And Jesus came and he knew it was going to happen to him. And he came. It's almost unbelievable. Would I have given my son to be treated that way? Would you give your son if you knew that he was going to be treated that way? But that's the gospel of God's grace. And it's announced on that day. And all of the Godhead is involved. God the Father speaking out from heaven. Imagining being there in that vast crowd and hearing the voice coming down from heaven. Eh? It's got to affect you. It must affect you. Some days I just feel, God, will you speak like that again? Would you, would you just sound your voice out from heaven so that people today would hear you? And yet he has committed his word to people like you and I that would spread the good news of his kingdom with a passion. Yeah. And so God the Father was involved as he spoke from heaven. God the Son is at the center of what's happening. And then the Holy Spirit comes down and remains on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he comes down like a dove. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit has made such a difference to this age. Because in Old Testament times, not many people knew about the Holy Spirit. But in New Testament times, in the church age, we know a lot about the Holy Spirit, don't we? Gosh, how our lives would be different without him. How much poorer we would be. And so the Holy Spirit is now given to all who will follow Jesus. Did you know that? Yeah? Yeah? He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. We're told that Jesus would do that with the Holy Spirit and fire, with power and purity, because that's what the Holy Spirit does when he enters our lives. He gives us power. It's the same power that, with which Jesus was raised from the dead. And you know that same power is in you. And that same power is in me. Well, when I sometimes look into my face and I look out in you tonight, I think, is that true? <laughs> is that really true? That that same power is in us? But that's what the Word of God says, isn't it? His power is in us. Should we wish to rely on it? Yeah. And of course, the Holy Spirit brings purity. 
It's a fire. He is a fire. And we saw that at Pentecost when he came down. It was in, in tongues of fire. And fire would remind us of refining. Because one of the biggest things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives is to, to change us, to, to be making us more like Jesus. To make us purer. We cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. Holy, holy, holy. And of course, that's what Jesus is. He is holy. He is pure. He is sinless. But did you realize that the work of the Holy Spirit is to purify us? Because we can't do it by ourselves. We can't do it in our own strength. It's utterly impossible. The people of Israel had tried it for thousands of years. And it got worse instead of better. But boy, the Holy Spirit, He can change us. And it's my privilege to know so many people whose lives have been changed because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus' message of the gospel is released into the world and that it is significantly different from John's gospel. It's the same in lots of ways because, yes, we have to acknowledge our sin, confess our sin, repent of our sin, we must believe that Jesus is the Son of God and receive Him into our hearts and lives. And when we receive Him into our hearts and lives as our Lord and Savior, that's the moment of our conversion. Yeah? When we're born again, when the Holy Spirit comes in. And, uh, and then, of course, we, we get baptized, don't we? That's the the way it works. We believe and then we get baptized. Not a baptism of repentance, but it's a baptism of public witness where you die and you come to life again. That's the picture of baptism. It's not washing. It could symbolize washing. Of course it can. Our sins are washed away. But believer's baptism is all about being buried. The old person is crucified with Christ. You know, what I'm saying is that when I come to Jesus, I'm, the old me is being put to death. And my life direction is turning around. And Jesus raises me from the dead into newness of life. And it's a different life. It's a wonderful life, isn't it? It is a wonderful life, an adventure with Jesus. And so in my personal view, baptism is a, a very important uh, step of obedience when we enter into the new life that is found in Christ. Receiving the Holy Spirit, of course, is wonderful. But what is even more wonderful and probably more important is that we have a desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit that He might fill us and control us and direct us more and more and more, yeah? So that we might produce fruit, and that will be the result of that. And the gifts that God gives to us by His Spirit can start to be practiced and used. Who thinks they don't have any gifts of the Spirit if you're a Christian? Anyone here who do doesn't think they've got a gift of the Spirit? Anyone here that thinks that they do? Oh, well, you, you are awake. <laughs> Does anybody think you might have more than one? Yeah. If you're a Christian, God has given you His Holy Spirit. And you've got at least one gift that He can use. And if you desire more, you'll get more. Yeah. And these gifts are really important. They're vital. And they're not all the same. 
It's so that the church can be built up. It's so that we can encourage one another. It's so that we can work to our full effect, yeah, as witnesses for him here and now. So if you don't think you've got a gift, change your thinking and begin to, to search out and try and figure out what your gift is, the gift that God has given to you. Sometimes you can discover it by asking other Christians, what do you think my spiritual gift is? Because they'll sometimes see what you don't see. Yeah. All I would say is that when the church is working right, the spiritual gifts are being, are being shown and used in everybody's life. Yeah. Desire spiritual gifts. Desire to be filled with the Spirit so that there might be less of you and me and my selfishness and your selfishness and we would become more like Jesus. Yeah, humble-hearted and just uh, full of love for each other and for people around us that don't know him. Yeah. So that's my memorable verse tonight. I wonder how many people are going to rush forward to get a prize next week. <laughs> because you want to tell me that as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is the Son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. And I think it says elsewhere, listen to him. Yeah. So God bless his word to us tonight. Is there any questions? That was when the Lord Jesus said in, in, in verse 15 of the chapter, it was to fulfill all righteousness. Now, I could be wrong in this, but um, I think what it means was that Jesus was up identifying himself with this, this world, with people of this world. He was identifying himself with sinners, although he was not a sinner himself. And he was saying, you know, that it, it was important that sinners repent and believe. Um, and that would be evidenced in baptism. And so he was going to identify himself with them and he was going to be baptized. Yeah. There is a sense in which I think I, I mentioned earlier that it was to fulfill all righteousness. And so there is this sense in which as Jesus was identifying himself with you and me as sinful you and me, although he sinned not himself, he would ultimately fulfill righteousness, fulfill the word of God by being obe obedient to the, the Father, God, Dad, and he went to Calvary and he became the Lamb of God that John said, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. No need for any more lamb sacrifices because he's your sacrifice and he will be crucified as your lamb who will take away your sin to fulfill all righteousness so that his perfect righteousness will be given to you and you and you and you so that tonight as a Christian, the God of heaven looks down on you, on you, on you, on you and he sees us just like his son. And our filthy sin was placed on Jesus on the cross to fulfill all righteousness. That's the way I see it. Not everyone might agree, but that's the way I see it. Any other questions? Well, you're welcome to come and speak to me afterwards. Um, would, would you like me to continue the question session as a, a feature in the future? Okay, then we shall do that. Yeah.
But we need to pray first, don't we? So Lord, uh, we come to you and we thank you. As we live in 2023 AD, we thank you that we have your living word and we are able to look back almost 2,000 years to that exact moment in time when God the Son broke into this world and at the moment he was going to begin his ministry. And he came to John and he asked to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Lord, we thank you so much that you sent your son into this world and that we are living as the beneficiaries of that, that the good news of the gospel has not been confined to the nation of Israel, but has spread all over the world through every generation to our generation. That was your heart and always has been your heart, is that your love would be known by everyone. And we thank you that the Lord Jesus brought your love into this world, but did so much more that he made a way for sinful men and women who were, who were away from God. He made a way for sinful men and women to be reconciled to a holy God because he went to the cross and bore our sins there. And tonight, Father, we have this amazing privilege of being in your presence and you're in the room and uh, we can worship you and we can extol you and, uh, and you love us, you want to embrace us and just say to us that we are special because of what you're done, your son has done. And so we pray that we might, we might just adore the Lord Jesus. That would be the word that I would use, that we would just adore you, Lord Jesus, day after day after day. And it would be the desire of our hearts to bear fruit for you. And so we ask it in your name. Amen.